Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. We'll let some folks trickle in, but as we do so, just to make sure you're at the right talk, this is the thesis validation framework aligning uh, product teams with the work that needs to be done. Um, specifically a tool we use at Riot and a bit of a follow-up to the previous uh, presentation in this room, which was about our R&D process. All right, let's jump in. So, hi friends. Like I said, my name is Alex. I am an insights manager at Riot Games. I'm a manager on the central user research team, which is specifically within R&D. I'm also the insights and strategy lead on the Riot MMO. Um, some context there, as per our previous talk, which we'll get into a little bit later, um, researchers at Riot can take on more of a product strategy role as well. And in terms of personal stuff, I play a lot of D&D. And as relevant to parts of this talk, a lot of MMOs. I'm an old EverQuest player, uh, emphasis on old. Uh, and then Tom was originally on this chat, and uh, we felt like it didn't quite make sense given the amount of content we were going to cover. Um, so it's just going to be me for this time. And then I did want to give him a shout out though. Uh, as I put together this framework for a lot of work we were doing, Tom was always there giving feedback, helped put together the templates, helped pilot it with teams, which was like invaluable. Also a shout out to Alex Page, who was with me on the project and helped me develop it. So thank you both. Um, in lieu of that, I have my cats because I have not given a presentation uh, without my cats since COVID. Um, so they have to be here with me, right? So this is Zelda and Fitz. All right. So I wanted to kick this off. This question, we got some very good feedback uh, when we submitted this talk. Someone was like, did you all just invent cold fusion? And we're like, oh no, it does kind of seem that way, huh? Uh, <laughs> we don't feel like we've completely solved game validation or that this is like an end all be all like solution to problems. Um, so the answer is no, like <laughs> does this completely solve game validation? It does not. That said, like we do think this framework is a helpful tool to orient around some really difficult problem spaces when you have high ambig ambiguity, when you want to understand what your product is and create a cool roadmap for really digging into it and, and communicating with design teams. So just setting expectations early on. So a little bit about what we'll cover today is some context for R&D at Riot, because I think that's important to understand like how this works and why it works for us, and then potentially understand how it could be ported to other organizations, you know, studios, publishers, um, external vendors, stuff like that. Um, next, we'll get into an overview of the framework itself. What were the goals? Kind of what are the segments of it? We'll look at the process, so dig into some of the nitty gritty. And then we'll talk about takeaways and closing thoughts, like what did we learn from this process? So on a high level, one thing I did want to say is I was really stoked when, when I got here, seeing Lainey's keynote was absolutely fantastic. But what I realized is like awesome, like this, there's a thematic running through the conference this year about, you know, to Lainey's point, insights communities, but driving buy-in and creating strong partnerships. And the way I see this talk, and you know, shout out to Kirk's talk as well, because followed on very well from that. I see this as one potential tactical manifestation of that. And so I was just really, really excited to see. So keep that in mind as you view, like this is one way that we found to kind of execute on that in, in a very specific way that we had some success with. And then obviously we'll have some questions at the end. So for R&D at Riot, and this will be really truncated um, because we covered this in, in the talk in this room beforehand, but I wanted to cover it for folks who didn't see that talk. So first off, Insights at Riot, we've got a huge degree of buy-in, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but the thing that you should take away is that we're sought really early in the process. We have a high degree of buy-in, and we view Insights work as dev work. So that has allowed us to kind of be more involved than maybe you would you would expect it at some other places. And I know that's true for a lot of you all as well, but just some context for what this is. Um, also, Riot takes a thesis-based approach to development, and you know we partner really closely with teams. We do a lot of product strategy and design work in addition to research work. Um, and then finally, as those of you who work in R&D or incubation know, it's real tough. It's highly complex, very ambiguous. You've got a full range of possibilities and options to explore, and really figuring out 
how you edit that list down and how you have confidence is just, it's, it's hard, right? Um, so in learning this the hard way by going through it with a lot of games, we came up with some creative solutions to make sense of that chaos. And this, this framework is kind of one of those tools in our toolbox. All right, so let's jump into the framework itself. So you're probably asking, okay, well, what is this? You keep saying the word framework a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'll probably say it too much. Um, but what this really is, is a process to run a game th thesis through to better understand it. A set of measures to break down and understand the game thesis. Or really lenses, I think is probably a better term here. A group exercise to run with teams and a prioritization plan to inform project roadmaps and testing schedules. Um, when we put this together, the goals that we really wanted to accomplish, and some high level context here is, I was working on a lot of games where in that ambiguous space, making sure communication between the teams, stakeholders, and insights was healthy, and making sure we were aligned on what we needed to build was just tough. We'd run into situations where it's like, well, what what should we test at this point, right? When, we, when you have a blank canvas, how do you even get started? So I set up just a, a high-level goal framework, right? So initially, it's like, let's improve understanding of the thesis. Let's create clarity on the purpose and expectations around what the game is and make sure that everyone is aligned on that, right? That we're not coming in with assumptions that vary. Or when we, when we are, we can address those and mitigate them. Um, creating a shared vocabulary and tools for the team to leverage. So once we kind of have this as common knowledge, we can then discuss things more quickly and easily. And then identify and resolve potential miscommunications. Um, and this could be around what the game is, but it could also be around expectations for what we expect at a given stage or what standards we're being held to. Um, the second one is in, informed and improved prioritization and planning. So what are the, the critical areas that we really need to focus on early, whether that's a high risk area, it's highly ambiguous, it's really important to the product. Um, determine what we can safely deprioritize, right? Like, what are you not gonna be held accountable for? What do we not care about right now? Um, and then overall improving work efficiency um, so that we're not wasting time or wasting cycles on things that we can safely ignore, or that we can push to later, that kind of thing. And so we can like combine work intelligently um, such that we can like knock down as many things at the same time. And then overall, like greater chances of the game's success. So we want increased conf confidence in our validation approach. Uh, we want to create foundations for player validation early in the dev process, like how do we get players involved as early as possible and get the teams thinking from a player perspective as early as possible. And then identify unknowns and risk areas. So what are those things that we anticipate? And we're never 100% right on this, but what are the things early on that we can safely identify are going to be high risk areas that we'll be investing um, a lot of knowledge work in? So it's just a high level of what this is, and that's very abstract. So I want to make sure to dive in on the actual details as well. So the framework process itself, how we went about this, like, hey, how'd you do this, right? So if you saw the previous talk, we talked a little bit about Riot's approach to games from a thesis perspective, and I'll cover that really quickly here so you all have context. So we start by defining the thesis and the pillars. We then break that down into components that are kind of like digestible, which we'll I'll have some examples of that later. But this really allows you to see like what are the experiential manifestations of the, the thesis and the pillars. We apply the framework um, to each of those components to really understand where we think that falls in terms of prioritization and importance and risk. And then we use that to inform what, when, and how we validate. And this also informs like what builds look like at different stages in development, um, what we care about, you know, what are the features in there, what types of players are we bringing in, that kind of stuff. And you're probably asking, what is a game thesis anyway? Um, so the way we view this is we start with an opportunity, right? Like what is an underserved audience or a type of player that has a dream or a goal that's not being met, you know? Uh, is there an underrealized game that's like pretty cool, but not landing in a lot of key ways? Is there a disruptable market where there's this empty ecological niche that can be filled, right? Um, essentially, it's a diagnosis of current player and market needs and desires, right? And we'll translate that into, into a thesis. And there was a good question from the last talk. is like, do you start with the audience first or the thesis first? And 
it's kind of a chicken and egg as a result of this, right? Um, so the thesis itself, how do you address that opportunity, right? It's a thoughtful diagnosis of the problems and opportunities along with a set of solutions to approach uh, and capitalize on those, on those problems. But most importantly for us, like a thesis is testable, right? <laughs> Ideally. And so this is the process of like, how do we make it testable and how do we make it testable in a logically consistent way that is manageable over the course of like all of development, right? So at this point, it's getting probably more theoretical than less. And I would love to give you an example, but I work in R&D. <laughs> so this is our good friend Randolph. We have to keep it secret. We got to keep it safe. So I cannot talk about any of the examples that kind of this process was born out of. But what I did do is I went and took a game that hopefully most of us are familiar with. And I'm going to use that as kind of an example template to walk you through what this process looks like. Um, so I took Breath of the Wild specifically because there's a really good 2017 GDC talk where they basically do exactly this. They explicitly state their thesis <laughs> and a lot of the pillars, and they walk through their validation process. So I was like, oh, perfect. Like, I can have an informed approach, and I don't feel like, oh, no, have I, <laughs> have I tried to analyze Breath of the Wild and gotten it wrong, right? So I at least had a starting point. I, I had a little literature review I could do. Um, so a quote from that GDC talk. Um, so the key was to rediscover the essence and break conventions. What we wanted to accomplish with this new Zelda was to create a game where the player can truly experience freedom in, a, in an expansive play field. Through exploring this field, we wanted the player to experience a sense of adventure again and again while navigating through it as they see fit. In other words, this means a game where the player can think and decide on their own where they want to go and what they want to do. So I took this and I said, okay, let's put this into like a Riot thesis format and kind of landed on something like this. And this could take a lot of forms. And if you want to nitpick this, please do. Like this actually demonstrates part of the value of this process is if you don't agree with this, it creates a cool conversation where we can make sure we're identifying those gaps. So the way I translated this was so let's modernize the Zelda formula by incorporating a high degree of agency and immersive simulation in an open world. And this will reinvigorate the IP and broaden player appeal. So that would potentially be a thesis that we could take from that quote previously. And from that, the pillars that, that I kind of identified were agency and freedom, emergent gameplay, and exploration and discovery. So I'm just going to focus on this first one. I'm not going to fully break down Breath of the Wild with this process. I'm just going to take one pillar and have a few examples from it, right? So in the agency and freedom example, some potential problems you might identify, and you can work through these an example of what this process would look like is sitting down with devs, making sure you have this conversation and there's clarity around what the game is, what the thesis is, what the opportunity is, and really like setting them, them up with prompts to discuss what are the problems, what are the solutions that make up each of these pillars. So one potential problem, right? Um, collision and, and inaccessible aspects of games can break immersion and feel limiting. Solutions, players can go anywhere and reach anything. There are no hard limitations. The thesis component that we could sum this up with would be something like no hard gates or limitations. Another one could be a low number of player verbs with limited impact can lose novelty quickly and potentially feel overly gamified. A solution to that could be players have a ro robust and impactful toolkit that provides a breadth of options to interact with the world. The thesis component there, simplifying it down, would be impactful player toolkit, right? So this is just like breaking down what the thesis is, those key components, and then how do we have these bite-sized, really grokkable, easy to understand elements that we can then evaluate, right? Um, another one is a set path um, can make a game feel like someone else's adventure rather than a player's own if there's a really strict golden path, right? So a solution could be players can choose their own path, create their own adventure without needing to follow um, an intended route or play style. So this might be no strict golden path, right? So if we, if we did this for the whole game, there might be more in this pillar. We'd do this for all the pillars. And we'd have a, a set of these components, which then we'd take collectively um, with the designers and with the game team, and we'd analyze. Um, how do we analyze these? So we use these, this set of like lenses to look at these, and we evaluate each component on these criteria. The first one is importance. And 
this is really importance to the overall game or the product. Um, this, how critical is this to the game's success? Some possible considerations here are, is this a core differentiator or, or innovation? Like, does this define the game? Like, if this thing is not in, will the thesis not be true, right? Um, is it interrelated to other core features? Is this just like absolutely necessary? Is it contingent for other key aspects? Is it critical for our target players? If we have identified like a bullseye audience, is this absolutely necessary? Um, and you could come up with some others, but overall this is like how important is this element to the game's thesis? The next one is ambiguity. So what are the number of unknowns? Potential considerations here for this lens is like what's the amount of risk? What's the degree of novelty? What's our confidence in the direction? Do we have past experiences doing this? Do we have no past experiences doing this? Is it a deviation from player expectations in a key way? Are there audience profile conflicts? Do we have two different audiences that might interpret this feature differently, right? Like one who loves it and one who hates it, for example. And then the, the last lens we use is difficulty. And this can be difficulty to build. This can also be difficulty to validate. Like how confident are we as researchers that we can come up with a good methodology to get an accurate signal? But also, what is the lift, right? So what's the effort, cost, time, and scale? So some potential considerations here are testability, buildability. Are there dependencies to actually make this true in either a paper prototype or a build itself? Are there emergent elements that are required for, for us to get a clear signal on this? Are there multiple interacting systems that are contingent here? Um, and some other ones are like, hey, if it's about social play and you just need a ton of players, like that's also difficult, right? So it's, it's anything that makes it hard to get a read on. So what we do with these is we start out by focusing on the first two and just mapping them on like a two by two so you'll see on the, the y-axis we've got ambiguity, so high to low, and on the x-axis we have importance to product, so that's low to high. One call out here for importance too is like, because these come from the thesis and the pillars, pretty much all of them are going to be relatively high importance. So when we map these out, one thing we, we talk to the leads about is we, we'll say, hey, Think of low on this scale as seven out of 10 and high as 10 out of 10, because we've already self-selected for what we think is important. So we're trying to get a relative kind of lay of the land here. And how we usually do this process is we'll have a mural board or a whiteboard, and we'll sit down with the leads and we'll, we'll introduce each thesis element and we'll say, all right, like on the count of whatever, the count of 10, let's all place where we think it lies so we don't prime or anchor each other, right? And then we'll kind of see, do we independently land in, in a similar area? And, and if not, that creates really cool conversations. At first I thought, cool, if we're aligned, that's a success. What I later learned was when folks are not aligned on where <laughs> something lands, that's actually even more valuable. It's even more of a success. I saw a lot of situations where there were just like two clusters of points and it was often either based off of like some, some SME differences, like subject matter expert knowledge, some default assumptions, lack of definition of terms. But what it really did is it, it made sure that the team was aligned on what each thing was and how to build it, right? So depending on where it lands on this two by two can inform how important we think that problem is to solve and when we can solve it. So if it's in quadrant one, uh, we would call this critical and unknown. It's highly ambiguous, but it's also highly important. Thus, we must validate, right? If it's high ambiguity, ambiguity but low importance, we would say, hey, this is minor and unknown. We could validate. If it's minor and we're confident, low importance, low ambiguity, we could also validate. This would normally be the won't validate <laughs> if we're going with the traditional like Moscow framework, but as a researcher, I never like saying we're definitely not going to play test. So I like keeping that as a could, but that one could very easily become like, hey, it's a risk we're willing to take. But it's a good conversation to have if something lands there. And if it's high importance but low ambiguity, this would be like something absolutely critical to the game, but maybe we've seen it in other games. There are side-ins. That one might be like, okay, cool. We've, we've seen this realistically borne out in practice. Um, I think we should still validate because it's critical, especially within the context of our thesis and game. So this is like a should validate. 
So like I said, sit down with folks and, and map things out. We got our, we're our buddy Heimerdinger here. This, these take a long time, but they generate a lot of really good conversations. So with those thesis elements that we kind of went over before, this is roughly where I think they might land. And again, if you disagree with this, you're probably right. Um, <laughs> it, at least it, what, that would be a win for me because we'd have a good conversation about it, right? Like I did not work on Zelda uh, Breath of the Wild, but I was like, this is a good example. So for impactful player toolkit, I would say this is probably like a must validate, right? It's kind of high ambiguity, high importance. For no strict golden path, probably a should validate. It's high importance, lower ambiguity. We've seen some games do that with success. <clears throat> and for no hard gates um, or limitations, high ambiguity, but probably a little bit lower importance. And then you do that, you know, <laughs> repeat for all thesis elements, kind of map them out and see where they're at. And next, we shouldn't re re forget about difficulty. Um, there was a really good question for the last talk. Um, to summarize was basically like, hey, what about tech stuff? You know, for the last right talk, we talked a lot about design, but like, what about tech limitations? This is actually a perfect spot where that comes in because this is where we can discuss like, is there tech needed? Are there things we just can't build? So at this point, what you would do is you'd take the outputs from the previous exercise and you'd map them here. So impactful, um, impactful player toolkit, probably lower difficulty to implement. And we saw this in practice with Breath of the Wild because what they did is they just took the original Legend of Zelda, it added an impactful toolkit to validate in prototype. So they actually did this. They were like, hey, this is high importance and low difficulty, let's test it. <clears throat> no strict golden path, probably medium difficulty. This requires an engine with an in-game build probably. You could get creative with solutions, but that's kind of how I would imagine that being tested. No hard gates or limitations. This has just a lot of contingencies. Like a lot of other systems need to be in the game to get a read on this, so this would be like a high difficulty to solve. And based on where these land, again, repeat for all thesis elements, um, this impacts your strategy. So if it's low difficulty, but it's a must validate, uh, you know, let's play test ASAP. <laughs> like that's, that's a no brainer, right? You can supplement this with design docs, side ends, concept work. Um, if it should validate, probably play test early and supplement with those same, same other elements. If it's could validate, um, do it opportunistically when it makes sense, when there are other things that you're testing that are, are relevant you can combine with. High difficulty is a different matter, right? Like this is like, we need to build out servers, we need better performance, there are a lot of usability needs, right? So you have to be more mindful here. If it's a must validate and high difficulty, it's like, Let's leverage design docs, side-ins, concept work, thought work early to really understand the space. And we probably can't play test early, but we should do it as soon as possible. And we could use this process to inform when that as soon as possible is. Should validate, very similar, but lower priority. And then could validate opportunistically, but this could also just be a risk we're willing to take. Like if this is a could validate and it's hard, then we probably don't wanna waste team cycles on this. So once we've got kind of that overall, we can determine approaches. And you saw a few of these, right? So on our list, we've got you know, play testing, concept testing, design docs, side-ins, audience research, other methods, and this could be highly contingent on your context and feature. And then, like I said, NA, a risk we're willing to take. And this one's actually really important because there were times where stakeholders might be holding the team accountable for something and I would sit down with leads and we'd run it through and I'd be like, I honestly think we shouldn't be holding them accountable to this right now. And then the stakeholders are like, oh yeah, you're right. We shouldn't, done. Um, and even if they don't agree, you're having that conversation, right? And at least you've set expectations properly. And then what you would do is just kind of combine all those outputs, throw them into a little table. So imagine that we did this for the whole thesis for just agency and freedom. We've got these, we've got each element with the strategy, the difficulty, informing the timeline when we think we want some level of signal here, and then what our approaches could be to approach it. And again, a lot of this, don't treat this as like absolutely necessary way to do it. I think the thought work here is most important. So as long as you're thinking through, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of your timeline and approach. And then how can we validate what's needed with the least amount of work? So at this point, 
you, once you mapped everything out, you can see, okay, we've got a lot of must validates that are within difficulty. What should the builds look like to target the maximum number of those thesis elements at a given time? So we can knock all those down and the team knows like, okay, cool, this is a cohesive vision for a build and it knocks off like five on our list, right? And then you can do this for each stage in development. I also tend to recommend what we've seen success with out of this is like rerunning this at each stage in development. So run it in prototype. Once you get into pre-production, things will change. Like ideally, ambiguity will go down on some and you can, you can refactor and have a better idea of kind of what's going on, right? Um, also, your priorities might change. Your audience might change. You might have new learnings. So this is not like a deterministic thing that you want to cue to necessarily. But an example of what this could look like, right, is in prototype, again, this is what we saw with Breath of the Wild, is they took the original Le Legend of Zelda uh, on NES, and they used that as a base. And this would inform what's the build scope, right? Like, this would be the original Le Legend of Zelda prototype build with new abilities that interact with the world. So there's like so, some systemic design here, like create fire, it creates wind, that kind of thing. <coughs> Emergent player systems, like I just mentioned. And then what thesis elements would this cover, right? This would cover robust player toolkit, uh, intuitive game physics, which I didn't mention, but would probably be um, one of the, the exploration uh, elements. And then there'd probably be a few more if we were like to flesh this all out. So ideally what you'd want to see here is like maximize the number of thesis elements covered. And then this, you would understand what the build should look like. And so work with your designers here, right? To, uh, to kind of ideate on what builds would be most efficient to knock some of this stuff down. For pre-production, maybe an RCGE. So like a vertical slice open world test, the build scope could look like uh, a vertical slice of the open world, so maybe just like one one tower zone. Um, what we saw from that GDC talk with Breath of the Wild is they learned they wanted to do like a line and point travel system where each of the towers, you'd move between them. They're like, hey, this doesn't work. It still feels like we're being led around. There's not emergent gameplay. But this would cover the no strict golden path, robust player toolkit, and intuitive game physics. Practically, what we saw in the Breath of the Wild example is they were like, yeah, this doesn't work. We, they, they ended up with a different approach of like triangles where you would climb to the top of anything, see new goals, and do some goal formation on the fly. So we can kind of see how they went about uh, testing that game. And then I'm just sort of retrofitting this onto the process. Highly recommend that GDC talk if you haven't seen it. So takeaways. We've run this with quite a few games. Um, quite a few of our games in R&D, and then even some live games. So <laughs> we're running it on, on League and Valorant, uh, different game modes for them right now as well. And we've had a lot of learnings. Um, things that, oh, before I get into that, I think the philosophy is key, right? Like you can't do this with at every org or with every team. Um, but when you do, we want to make sure that it's like done as healthily as possible, right? So defining what I think this is, philosophically to be healthy is this is collaborative. It's created together uh, with the design team and then often with stakeholders later on to ensure all voices are heard and concerns are discussed, right? It's iterative, so this is updated based on dev stage. When there's new findings, it's framed within the larger project, project the roadmap, um, and the feature set. And it's just one of many lenses. So we should be applying other frameworks, other tools to inform what the roadmap is and what the feature set is. <clears throat> and then what this isn't. So things we definitely want to avoid. This is not deterministic. This is not a prescriptive straight jacket or a mandate for how we should approach or understand the project. It is not static. You know, This is not something we create once, but rather something we update over time. And it's not monolithic. It's not our only approach to, to thinking about the problem or understanding the game. And then in terms of our takeaways, a few that we have seen is there's been high value um, from just the conversations this generates, right? Like outside of the roadmap or how this informs playtest schedules and that kind of thing, just getting all the leads in the room and making sure they understand the game and they're thinking about it from a player perspective and they start identifying potential risks together or even when they disagree and they're like, oh, we didn't even realize we disagreed on this. It's, it's huge, right? or even between the stakeholders and the team. Um, you don't need to run the entire thing. If you just want to run part of this, awesome, go for it. It doesn't need to be like a front-to-back process. 
it's been valuable across the dev, dev stages for us and benefits uh, from updates at big milestones. <clears throat> so I wasn't sure, like, how does this work in production? We had a team in production, they were like, we should have done this earlier, but it was super useful. They realized that their, when they broke down their pillars into out, like elements, they were like, they were just so tactical feature oriented that we should question the assumptions of how we chose to action on this. And this made us realize there was a bigger possibility space on how to approach the problem and serve the players. It doesn't need to be a formal process. And what I mean by this is like, hey, if you've got buy-in and you can sit down with, with your dev team and run through this, awesome. If you don't, like run it yourself to better understand the game or like be able to pitch like potential playtest schedules or help inform how you want to validate as you work with your teams. So like I said, you can run it solo to help yourself orient. That said, collaboration, always better when you can do it. So that is a real high level of kind of how we've, we've gone through this process at Riot, how we've learned to help inform validation and really just give dev teams tools and a shared vocabulary to like communicate better between themselves, between themselves and stakeholders and with us. Um, yeah, thank you so much. All right, questions, you in the back. Oh, that's a great question, yeah. One thing I didn't include here, and it, it's a super important access or lens, is how do each of these relate to our audience? I think this was presented as if our bullseye audience was like already accepted and it might be the only one. Another way you could approach this is like add in an audience layer where you're like, here's a few of our potential audiences and how does this relate to each one and how might they differ? Um, that's a really good question. It's It's one of those things where I've definitely run into what, oh God, I didn't repeat the question. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me do that real quick. Um, so the question was, what was the question again? <laughs> so, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna like. Totally, yeah. So the question is, how do you prevent yourself from casting too wide a net um, when determining your audience, right? And making sure you don't make too many assumptions and that you also have a clear direction, something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's tricky. Um, what I would say is this helps you keep that in mind if you add it as part of the process. And it allows you to reassess that at key stages. So it doesn't necessarily, I think that problem is always present and this helps you keep it top of mind and constantly be thinking about your audience and questioning whether the decisions you've made were the right ones and or if you need to make reprioritizations. Yeah. In terms of collaboration with any process, uh, is there a priority or is it the goal first? Yeah, good question. So the question to restate is, um, because this is ideally collaborative, who do you prioritize in including first? Um, yeah, let me think through that. I think the, the broad answer I would say is the dev team themselves. If you have buy-in with the leads, and by leads I mean like discipline leads, so like di directors of, of each, whether it's creative, design, product management, et cetera, um, find who you've got buy-in with uh, and start with them, and then slowly build that up. Uh, if you've got buy-in with the leads already, awesome. You do want to make sure to loop in the larger team, but it's really critical to make sure you've got the leads buy-in and, and that they're aligned on this process first. So I'd say dev team is priority. If you can, any number of leads, ideally all of them. Um, and then once you've got alignment there, uh, taking that output and, and getting alignment with stakeholders. And I would normally include the leads on that too. So like take your, your output and be like, hey, this is what we think this game is and when we think we're gonna have stuff online and when we care about it. 
Does this make sense? Do you disagree or agree? Creates that conversation. And then I think the last part is going back to the larger team, the larger dev team, and sharing so they're all aligned as well, and making sure everyone has a hand on the wheel throughout that process. No one feels like this is a mandate or a declaration, but that you're always creating uh, an avenue for conversation and input at each stage. Cool. Okay. Oh, good question. So the question was, um, for the potential approaches for validation, what is a side-in? So side-in uh, refers to any existing feature or game that, that exemplifies the thing that you care about that has kind of been tested out in the real world. So the game has been launched, you kind of have player perception on whether it works, or you have your own insight into what does or doesn't work about it. Something that is in the wild, whether that's a feature, whether it's part of a genre, whether it's a whole genre. So a side-in can be a bunch of different scales of things, but usually I feel like it's a, an existing feature in, in, a, in another title that's out there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So the question was, uh, in addition to side-ins for those validation approaches, things like concept testing um, and design docs, sort of like what, what do those pr practically look like? I know for us, um, this can be creating, for concept testing specifically, you might want to create primes, whether this is uh, a deck or something readable or some sort of artifact that you can show players, get their reflections on. Um, if you've got some sort of mod or another build that you can approximate an experience with, if there is another title that's comparable or relevant, and you can do a benchmark test and specifically ask about an ele element, um, those could all be forms or paper prototyping, right, of concept testing. So any scrappy research, I would say. Uh, and then design docs, that's just working with, with the designers on their documentation from the lens of this framework and from a player-informed and research-informed lens so that they're kind of integrating the research process into their thought and they're like, hey, here's my pitch for how I think this feature would work. This is why I think it would serve players or this is why it's serving the motivations that, that my researcher has said these players have, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was about the development process and do we have kind of a set timeline for when a thesis might be created, when we're testing, when we might be running something like this? Is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'd say it varies. For the thesis, that at Riot at least, it is really core to the project pitch and the way we handle stuff. So games essentially like almost necessitate a thesis and an audience to even be happening. Um, so that's pretty locked in early on. We'll obviously sanity check that at certain gates as, as they progress, like, hey, this might be cool, but it not, might be not what we expected, and that's okay. And we might want to move it forward, just redefine it. For this, I think we're getting to a point where we would like to have some best practices around when it's applied. Currently, we've just been doing it on a case by case. But every time we've introduced the idea, like we get more people like, hey, can we, can we do this exercise? So we're finding that it's, it's applicable throughout, but higher value the earlier you get started. So we, we usually leave this up to like dev team and researcher discretion. Um, but ideally, we'd love some best practices there. We just don't have them yet. Good question. Uh, in the back.
That is a great question. So um, to, to rephrase it, or to reframe it, restate it rather, um, we had a slide where we talked about breaking down the thesis element into like problem and solution statements and whether or not, hey, is there just one solution per problem? Um, are there multiple? Is this when you decide? Great question. Um, that's one way to approach breaking it down. Um, we find that those are good prompts, like what are the problem statements that exist or problems players could experience. Another way to do it is like, what are the player dreams or aspirations we want to capitalize on? So I would say you don't need to start with the problem statement. You also can. And then to your specific question, which is excellent, is there could be multiple solutions, but we found this was a good forcing function to be like, what are what do we think is the leading solution, right? But one thing that it does too is you do want to avoid it being like an explicit tactical feature. So if you can keep it experiential or broad, such that the feature that can create that experience for the player could take a lot of forms, that's I think ideal. Um, and that doesn't limit you prematurely. So I don't know if I did it sufficiently well here, but I think that's always the goal, is, is make those proposed solutions or proposed player dreams more experiential and motivational, such that they can be acted on in a potentially different ways, and you can experiment between those to see what works best. Cool, I think we got, yeah. Ooh, great question. So this one was, what are the, uh, the most likely parts of the process that may get off track based on prior experience? Um, I would say what I have witnessed is having a lot of success with team buy-in. Once they see this, like, oh, awesome. Like, let's run with this. And then stakeholders, like, forgetting about it, right? So really making sure that you hold other folks accountable, like, hey, we agreed on this. Like, we can't, we don't care about this right now, right? Um, so that that's one thing I've seen, because they just deal with a lot of stuff. Um, and they can, you know, sometimes forget. Um, I'd say the other is, when you really get to the end, when you're like, what do we action on, right? When we're talking about understanding the game, that's great, and that has value. And even if you stop there, it still has value. But what often I see happen is, well, this is fuzzy how do we decide ex exactly when to test X or Y or exactly what to test? So it gets increasingly complex when you're framing what should be in the build, when should this be tested? So making sure that you don't lose steam there and that you keep buy-in is key. That's a really good question. Do we have time for any more? Okay. Okay, uh, in the back. Yeah, no, this is great. So the first part was like, um, just like this cautionary statement, like frameworks shouldn't necessarily be the end all be all because we don't know the unknown unknowns, which completely agree with, very true. And the second bit was like, when you get down to the specifics, do you have like sub frameworks to, to make sure that you can <laughs> align on, on how things are, are being defined, if I understand correctly, right? Right. I didn't want this to get too nitty gritty, but I actually have like sub frameworks for things like importance and ambiguity that you can, you have some examples that you can apply back to and be like, we think these are some examples of why it would be important in terms of like ambiguity. It could be our chance of our risk percent of failure, things like that. Um, it's tricky. Um, and that is one thing I'd say is not fully solved, but the conversations that you create there can be important you can very well end up in a situation that's intractable where like people just are not aligned, but sometimes that, that ceases to be our job, right? Like if you can't get the creative director and the design director to agree on, you know, the, the ambiguity of your like, immersive world, like that's, that's, they're the SMEs, let them handle that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all the time I have. 
but definitely agree with, with the point on frameworks, not the end all be all. Like, this should be one step that helps you inform, right? You don't want this to be your only thing. You don't want to kill the magic, right? You, you still want creativity be, to be part of the process. But I think doing due diligence and thinking through your problem space equips you to improvise and capitalize on creativity and magic, even if you ignore this. The quote I'd say is like, planning is invaluable, plans are useless. So don't feel like you need to stick to it but create the cool conversations. Um, but yeah, that's me. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.